see it. Hello? 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 Test, Hello. test. Is that good? Cool. Test, 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 maybe. Okay. Is, it, is that working? Can you guys hear him? Can you hear me? Woo! All right. All right. Maybe a little louder. All right, cool. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Held for Ransom. We put the new face of malware. Ransomware is uh, far from new, but ThinkCon was looking for a ransomware talk, and they came to us, and we said, sure, we'll do it. So here we are. Uh, so I am Neil Weiler, uh, better known in this community as Grifter. I am a threat hunting and incident response specialist with RSA. Um, in my free time, I run all the technical operations at the Black Hat security briefings with this clown over here. Um, also the department lead for contest events, villages, parties, and the demo labs at DEF CON, and I help pick uh, the content for Black Hat and DEF CON as part of their review boards. I'm Bart Stump. I am just known as Bart. I don't have any special name like Grifter. Uh, I work for Optive during the day uh, in our MSS environment. Uh, do all the same stuff, the Black Hat, DEF CON, as well as Ada One Labs. We're both on the board for that as well here in Salt Lake. So, well, we're not in Salt Lake, but you get it. I forgot Ada One Labs. Sorry. Come to Ada One Labs. We have a hacker space. It's downtown Salt Lake. Come hang out with us. Um, it's basically how we keep this party going all year round. We've got Lockpick Village and a hardware hacking room and all that stuff. So, all right. So, um, we're just going to roll straight into it. First, with uh, just some foundational stuff, we're going to talk about adversaries and the different flavors of adversaries. So, um, they come in different forms, and I think these different ways classify um, how. Uh, I guess how we look at different types of attackers. So with non-state actors, we have insiders or the threat at the water cooler, uh, the person who's already in the organization. They have a certain amount of access already. Uh, they might, their motivations are varied. They might be upset because they didn't get a promotion. Or they might be working with someone who is just you know, paying them quite a bit of money to give them what they need. Of course, we've got our cyber terrorists. Or, Anonymous. That's right, yeah. Or hacktivists or whatever. Uh, mostly political targets or things for the lulls. Um, but, yeah, it's about disruption normally um, or shenanigans. Uh, going into criminals, we have our petty criminals. You can tell that guy's a hacker because he's wearing a black hoodie, which is, if you ever, I mean, just look around. Hacking in the dark. Yeah, if there's anybody wearing a black hoodie, then you know. Um, organized crime, we know they're organized crime because they're wearing leather jackets, so <laughs> good. Uh, and then, of course, our nation state actors, governments, uh, defense, indus uh, industrial base, really uh, sophisticated or well-funded. I, I guess I shouldn't always say sophisticated. Well-funded, at least. So, what we're going to focus on is mostly that portion right there in the center, the criminals. So ransomware is the, you know, uh, the criminal element are the ones who are using that. Uh, petty criminals can now, the barrier to entry to ransomware is basically nothing at this point. Uh, so there is ransomware as a service. Uh, and the, what was the cheapest one we saw? We said about a thousand, two thousand bucks for. For something that was good. Like, so for like Locky, like yeah. if you want to like start a Locky campaign, but if you want like some crap ransomware, you can get that for like 50 bucks. So, um, so maybe buy the $50 one and then you just work your way up to Lockheed. Um, get a couple payouts. It's a, it's a business model apparently. So, so I know when I talk to people who are, are norms, when we talk to the norms, they always say, why would anybody be interested in my machine, no one wants to hack me, or I don't care if I get hacked. Like, they're like, what? I have nothing that they can, of value, nothing they can take. But this is from uh, a Krebs article from a couple of years ago where Brian put together this chart, essentially, of why there is value in every machine. And this kind of lays out, like, look, you think there's no value in your computer, but 
you know, we can use it to be a server for these different things, you know, email attack, all this stuff. And of course, down there on the uh, hostage attack there, we have ransomware. So I think this ransomware kind of changes the story for a lot of people uh, in this regard. It doesn't care whether you're a large organization or whether you're a mom who now can't get to the pictures of her kids. Right? And honestly, that is a very interesting target as the attacker. The most, you know, uh, suburban norm dwellers or whatever aren't going to have air-gapped backups, and they're going to have things that are very personal and important to them on their machines. And so if you are able to infect that machine, encrypt all their files, and like I said, now they can't get to the pictures of their kids or grandkids, it's going to be worth $300 to them to... Get that that sentimental value is absolutely going to kick in a, a, a price factor there for those people. So they're going to be paying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, honestly, I mean, if somebody was like, oh, all the pictures of your kids are gone, but it's $1,000, like, I would pay that $1,000 immediately. And I think most people do. So, um, of course, I have air gap backup. So it's not a thing for me. So, looking at different events and how challenges have changed, we've got um, like Sony pictures on here. And I think. The main thing about Sony, everybody knows about the Sony attack and stuff like that. What was interesting about Sony was that it wasn't just, oh, we're going to go in and take your stuff and put your stuff online. Not only that, I mean, I guess essentially they created a backup. They, <laughs> they created a backup right? forum. Yeah, they uploaded it to the internet. So, um, but they went and destroyed all the backups as well. I mean, they sent, the attacker sent Sony into the Stone Age. When they were um, doing stuff, they were communicating with fax machines. Um, and paper messages, uh, they were cutting paper checks. Like it was, uh, it was severe. Like people always think, like, oh, they uploaded movies and it was embarrassing and the email stuff that came out and things. But they actually went in and deleted all of their backups and and crippled that company uh, because once they were in, they had access to everything. Um, looking at the Hollywood Presbyterian, this is the one a lot of people have heard about with ransomware, where they talk about medical organizations and stuff. This was the hospital that they encrypted all of their stuff, and they were just like, oh, we're completely locked out. Like, we cannot function as a facility. And they so, started moving patients to other hospitals <laughs> and other locations, other facilities, because of the ransomware, basically. Uh, and then it took them a minute, and they, they said, well, how much, how much would it cost us? I think it was the CEO who finally said, like, what's the ransom? Am I walking outside the tape? My bad. Um, uh, and I, what's the ransom? Like, what? And they were like, it's this many Bitcoin. What does that mean? You know? And they were like, uh, carry the one, $17,000. And they were just like, pay it. Pay it. And they paid it, and they got their decryption key, and off they went. So... It was a win-win. They got everything back, and the hackers got seventeen thousand dollars. So okay. you can see where ransomware hackers. is really yeah, hackers. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you can see where this really pays off. It's it, it really is a lucrative malware today. So yeah, it's um, uh, we were, we're looking at stats again, like doing research for the talk. Like there were, I, I found a few articles and stuff, and you can see there's links in the bottom. I was reading one of them, and it talked about a particular group in Europe who they had stood up. A, it was a small-scale malware campaign, but this particular group had then been compromised by a different security organization who was doing research on them. They found some documents on their um, like command and control servers and other stuff that, that was basically their bookkeeping. And it showed how many systems they had infected and how many people had paid in this amount of time and so like that. And this was a small-scale operation in Europe. It had a couple of countries, but they were making about 50 grand a day. So... That's nice. Um, but because of events like this, like Sony, um, things where these hospitals are getting hit, they're very high profile, they're in the news and stuff, we start to see what is essentially an unprecedented response from federal organizations. I mean, they act like they care. <laughs> it's, it's a surprise. Yeah, they, um, they you know, start releasing things saying like, oh, if this type of attack happens, if you're seeing this type of activity, this is how you should respond. Here's the things that you need to do to try to secure your environment and stuff like that. Obviously, with things like the cybersecurity framework from NIST and stuff like that, like the government, you know, is finally like really getting involved and saying, "Oh, maybe we should try to set some standards for at least what the minimum bar is for security." So, 
Um, it, it got quite a bit, quite a bit of organizations coming out. As you can see on that last slide, FBI responded within six days of the Sony attack, basically. So all these high-profile stuff have really gotten some of the feds involved and uh, keeping their eye on this as well. Yeah, so it's funny because I think, I mean, uh, like that time frame, the attack was still ongoing. Like, so they're Absolutely. actually like responding saying, oh, hey, like our buddy over here is getting attacked. You should not get attacked. Here's how. Um, but the attack was still ongoing at that point. Or they were still releasing data and you know, knee deep in their system. So again, we see a lot of stuff coming out um, saying like, hey, you know, here's some advice. And you can see in bold there are things like segregating network systems. Um, <laughs> and that's from the NSA, so we should all listen to them. That's right. They know what's up. <laughs> hey, if um, they, you notice they don't say air gap because they need to make <laughs> sure they have access <laughs> to all your stuff. Um, but if you look down further, you do see that is a common theme over and over and over again, air gap, air gap, air gap. And I mean, like, spoiler alert, we'll get to some things later in the presentation, but that is genuinely how you can protect your organization from ransomware. At this point, there's a couple of things you can do. There's some stuff that you can look for, but as uh, on, you know, when you boil it down, it's air gap backup. And making sure that those backups work. Everybody, <laughs> everybody has backups, but how often do you test restoring from those backups, et cetera? So once you have an, an actual air gap backup, test that you can restore from those backups, et cetera. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, so a new threat, like it's ransomware is everywhere. Like every day there's articles on ransomware. There are entire websites dedicated to new types of ransomware or just news about ransomware. Like, that's a thing. People just created it like sites and they aggregate news about ransomware and when master keys are released or different things like that. But um, looking at ransomware as a whole, there's, there's basically two types. Um, we have locker, which is, you know, blocking the machine. It's denying access to the actual machine itself. It just locks you out. Usually there is some type of lock screen. Um, it normally just is affecting the way that you interact with that machine. It's not uh, encrypting files on the back end or denying you access to the data. It's just annoying, basically. It keeps you from, from getting to what you need to do to work. Um, does anybody know like when the first ransomware was like used, like deployed? Yes, yeah, somebody just yell a year. Yell a year, you guys can yell a year. 2008. 2008. What? 89. Good man. The first appearance of ransomware was 1989. And it was spread by five and a quarter floppies. So, sneakernet. Whoop. Um, but yeah. And they, um, I, I think it was, what was it called? I think it was called the AIDS. It was called AIDS, I, I yes. Was called AIDS. Which the 80s, that's that, so. perfect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so not really that new. Um, but yeah, 1989 was the first uh, ransomware. When it starts to really ramp up in the news and stuff, I heard some people shout some dates that are closer to this. But we start looking at things like crypto ransomware. And this is where you're denying access to the data itself um, by encrypting it. But normally the computer is still usable because they want you to be able to go and buy your Bitcoin or whatever. You might change your startup page to say like, hey, this is where you go to buy Bitcoin. But um, but for the most part, you know, it's, uh, it's just encrypting anything that would be useful to you. Um, and then what well, would also make people kind of go, huh? Like this is, this is malware that announces that it's there, like which is a shift from what it used to be. It used to be that malware was as stealthy as possible until a certain point, and then it would destroy everything or do whatever or give you some political message or hack by Chinese. Um, but now... You know, it's like, it's actually saying, like, hey, I'm here. By the way, if you would like me to stop being here, just go buy this uh, money pack card from a CVS or whatever. So now, it's generally quiet until everything is encrypted. It doesn't want you to see yeah. that it's doing it unless you have some sort of endpoint that, that realizes those files have been changed, and, and that's not very often. Uh, to, to kill that process. It's silent until that happens, usually. But, but then it obviously announces its presence. Um, 2005. Yeah. So first documented appearance of crypto ransomware was 2005. 
uh, through fake installer apps. A lot of this was, like we were talking about the other day, uh, LimeWire days and uh, downloading just random movies and stuff. <laughs> you guys remember, you know, when you tried to like open up that RAR file and it was like, no, go to this website and then get the code after you filled out that. I see, look at you guys nodding. Like, yep, I remember. Um, so, yeah, it was 2005. That's when the you know crypto portion of this really started to take hold, and you start to see the campaigns become more and more. Um, I guess what am I trying to say? Like a business, I guess. And that's when organized crime starts to get involved, and they do function as a business. Again, they're wearing leather jackets, but they're really smart and savvy about what they're doing. So, everybody loves a leather jacket. So now we're just going to get into a little bit of the history of ransomware, so com some common ones uh, and what they did. So looking at this one, this is Adblock. Um, this is kind of what we we're talking about, that, um, that style of locker that just says, hey, you know, we, we've locked your machine. In some cases, this one would not only lock your machine, but it would do, it would put a pop-up up that said, like, you are a pedophile. <laughs> Like, it would legitimately be like, you have been found to be, you know, looking at child pornography or something like that. Please pay a fine. Like, I'm like, oh, that's, that's a finable offense. Um, but what, they, what it would make you do, the way they monetize this was by having you go through and do these offers. Like, you had to go in and fill out a bunch of forms or do whatever, and then after you completed each one of those, you'd put in whatever the code was that you got after you did those offers. And so... This is basically like Google AdWords revenue on steroids. Like they'd get a couple of bucks for every um, one of these offers that you did. So, so a in, small sum of money. Like so instead of monetizing it with Bitcoin and making you pay a lump sum, they just get marketing dollars basically from, from ads that you have to click on and go through to uh, release that crypto locker. Or, or excuse me, just locker. Yeah, maybe you get like super cheap iPad. Win-win <laughs> so, again. Yeah, again, everybody wins. Uh, so moving uh, on to Reviton. So this particular one, this is where we start to see um, social engineering. I know that's a terrible image to probably look at from... Yeah, it's a nice I guess, chart. Yeah, I was going to say, not even from the back of the room, from right there. But basically, it is it's saying like, oh, okay, we're, we're with the FBI, you know, Again, this is one of those, like, your, let's see what it actually, your PC is blocked due to at least one of the reasons specified below. I was just going to throw out a couple. You did one of these. But it gives you a list of things and then says, how do you unlock my, the computer? And then it says, well, you can do it using money back. <laughs> like, oh, so the FBI is like, go to Kmart or right Or 7-Eleven <laughs> yeah. or Walgreens. Grab some, grab a money pack card. And then just, you know, give us the code on the money pack card. It, it's how they do business. Um, but yeah, so you're seeing things like social engineering attacks being put into this. You're preying on people's fears. They're like, oh, no. Um, but this is highly, highly effective. Like, people kind of freak out. And they think, oh, OK, if I can just pay a fine and make this go away. Um, uh, one of the things that's common is they say, oh, you downloaded some movie or music or whatever like that. And that's such a common thing that people just assume, oh, no. Like I should pay this fine. It's kind of uh, we were uh, we were talking last night about the that IRS scam ring that got busted in India where they arrested like 70 people and then they're like you could bring up charges on an additional 600 or something like that. Like that they call you and just say like hey you're in trouble with the IRS. Call us back and then you have to pay these fines and please go get some like iTunes cards and let us know because that's how the IRS <laughs> also these guys use money pack the FBI. IRS takes their fines through iTunes gift cards. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this is, uh, this is a highly effective you know, uh, method. It also looks really slick in comparison to some of the previous things, which were normally just like a bam, like your machine is locked, ah, like with flames or something that was like, you can't get into your stuff. It looks official. It looks like you should actually go do that. Um, it's just clean and kind of slick. So. Um, so, Crypto Locker. So this is... Most people have heard of this one. Yeah, yeah. So this is where we end up uh, in a situation where the ransomware is telling us, you've got this amount of time. So 
Now it's about monetizing in a particular time frame. It's not just, oh, you're going to have to give us your money. It's you have 72 hours, and then you lose your files forever, which, again, is highly, highly effective. It freaks people out. What we start to see in stuff like that in ransomware and, and, and crypto uh, ransomware in particular is that it's, it will say, like, you owe us, I don't know, it will be $300, something like that. But then when it counts down to a certain point, it's like, now you owe us 400 And it counts down, now you owe us 500 So the faster you pay it, the cheaper it is, and it forces the individual, especially if you're like a mom and pop shop, small business or something, to just say, like, you know, every hundred dollars matters. Might not matter to, you know, a large hospital, but if you are just, um, you know, selling slushies out of a snow cone shack or something like that, you might you might think a hundred bucks is a lot of snow cones. So, um, so yeah. So this is like, you know, it starts to say like you're you've got this amount of time, otherwise you lose your stuff forever. Um, a lot of people say like, oh well, let's throw this out there, business model wise. Like ransomware is also effective because they actually give you the key. Like if you pay the money, you get the key. And I hear art I see articles all the time and people will quote things and they'll say, Oh, but if you pay the rent, don't pay ransomware ransom, because if you pay it, you might not even get your, your files back. And that's true, maybe, but like in outlier type cases. Because the business model for ransomware is that you in fact do get your files back. Because if you start going, well, oh, you might not get your files back, then people won't pay. They want you to pay. So they, if, if you decide, like, oh, I'm going to pay the ransom, they're going to give you your key. What's up, man? That's just poor business. There they is said they got hit with ransomware, <laughs> but the, they followed the links, and the site was down. So, so there are literally, and we'll talk about some of these, there are some campaigns that have died or, or gone away for whatever reason, whether they decided that it was a business decision to close down this ransomware because they had made enough money and they didn't want to get caught. There are definitely strains of ransomware that, that have been killed or died for whatever reason, and it doesn't exist anymore. However, some of those also have, have released the master key that you can find a master decryption key for those strains of ransomware. So th that that's not necessarily something out of the norm, but it is not a good business model. Not <laughs> as, a good business model. As Grifter said. Keep your sites up. Move to the cloud, people. <laughs> like, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, that sucks. But I think that's probably fairly uncommon. I think for the most part, you yeah, they are generally money. there to you take your money. Yeah. They're not. They're not and afraid and to and take your money. Here's an example of that. So Tesla Crypt. You guys have probably heard of Tesla Crypt. Incredibly popular um, version of ransomware. A particular type of ransomware. Kind of short-lived, if you think about it, too. If you look it at was, the dates. Yeah, it was a bit. But man, it was popular during that time frame. And again, this is like you know the. It's being used by different groups. Like you can buy into these things. You can set up your own turnkey. It's like, you know, my um, my wife was this summer like built a, a lemonade stand for my kids, and I was like, well, we just do ransomware as a service. We'll make much more money. Like, <laughs> she did not agree. So, um, so lemonade it is. The but if you look on the bottom of this notification from Tesla Crypt, it's it says support. Like support is there. You click on support and for their message center. And if you're having problems, if you can't reach the website, if you're like unable to figure out how to get Bitcoin or go to Walgreens and get your money pack thing or whatever, they will walk you through the steps for what you need <laughs> to do. They'll explain exactly how to get the money to them. So it's like so like some easy. of these guys had numbers even. Yeah. Some some phone yeah. numbers. Yeah, you could call in and you'd get phone support, like from the Philippines or India or something like that. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, again, we're talking about like a legitimate business model here. These people who are doing these campaigns are running it as a business, and it's, a incredibly, it's an incredibly lucrative business. Uh, but yeah, support centers. So now you've got support going in there. So what, uh, this, we've got an asterisk here, and I guess I'll save it. I'll save it for later. But um, we'll talk about how that support center uh, works in a little bit uh, to the advantage of the folks who were hit by this. <coughs> and then, of course, 
um, we've got Locky. So Locky is, um, is the bell of the ball right now. Right? It's <laughs> really the one that, that is prevalent right now yeah. in, in the industry. For it's, sure. uh, it's got some good features. It's terrible about it. It's great feature. It's, really it's got an awesome feature set. And the coders, like, no, I mean, it really is. It's cleanly written. It's nice. It's got easy to understand instructions. It changes your default page. So you open up your browser and there's the instructions on what you need to do with the links and everything. It also changes your desktop wallpaper with the same instructions and tells you what you need to do. Um, it encrypts not only your, you know, the stuff that's on your machine, but all of your network uh, connected devices as well, whether they're mapped to that machine or not. It just scans your network. It's going to access something. It gets encrypted. So, Which, um, again, that's why air-gapped air backups. Air-gapped air backups. Um, and so, but this one is, um, we talked about, it's a, uh, uh, you can you can get in on a locky campaign. I, it's a couple thousand dollars, like if you want to start your own locky campaign. And you just get on, you know, a, a dark net and sign up. So easy weird. as that. It's like Facebook. <laughs> it's so weird. It's easy. It. I'm telling you, it's like a lemonade thing. Um, so, but it is a, this is a very dynamic type of malware. It's always changing. There's always like, like the flavor of the month type of thing. Um, who is the current bell of the ball? You can see here the top 10 ransomware families from June of 2015 to November of 2015 where um, we've got a bunch of different stuff in there, fake, BSOD, uh, crowdy, stuff like that. But then only the, and in the next six months following that, so from December of 2015 to May of this year, we see a huge shift towards Tesla Crypt. Like, a lot of people move off crowdy. It's not like that it's gone away, you know, 17%, but the feature set, the way that it, um, the response that it gets, all that kind of stuff, the way that it's coded, the reliability of Tesla Crypt is such that all of these campaigns are starting to move to that particular type of malware. Um, I'm really, really interested in this one to see where it's going to land. Uh, this was done, this, these charts were put together by Microsoft. The, the you know, link is down there in the corner. But it was, um, uh, I'm really interested to see when they do from you know, June until November where, uh, where Lockheed shows up. Yeah, if you see Lockheed's only 7% right now, or, well, December to May. Yeah. December to May, it was only 7%. And but Tesla Crypt was 42%. Right, so, um, so yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be in the Tesla Crypt bucket when you look at Lockheed for the, for the last six months. But I guess we'll find out. <clears throat> Entry point. So how do you get infected with ransomware? There's lots of stuff here. Uh, we're still living in the 90s. Microsoft Office attachments with macros. We need to learn to quit clicking on those, downloading attachments that we don't know from senders, etc. Uh, browser launching JavaScript code, something that is, again, very common and, and we see plenty of times uh, in other malware as well. Um, Downloads from infected websites. So once again, something else that's already infected. You go to that that website, and you're infected. It just spreads that way. Uh, fake installers again. Back to the LimeWire days. Yeah. Again. So I mean, looking at these things, the entry points for malware. This hasn't changed, guys. Like these are the same issues that we've been dealing with for 20 years. Like, I, I it's still broken. Again, a lot of this stuff, I mean, these are user interactions. Our users are going out there and they're clicking on these things and doing whatever. Obviously, it's like, you know, office attachments with macros in it. We have a warning that pops up. It's like, this contains macros. Look, it's trying to do this thing, blah, blah, blah. And people are just like, yeah, run it. Like, sure, I want to make sure this document works the way I expect it to. So, yeah, run the macro and then you get owned. So, these are not new issues. Um, we just still are kind of fighting the same battle, trying to figure out. Like, how do we get our users to stop freaking clicking things? Um, but yeah. So we'll talk about like recognizing the variants, like things like if you're looking at your endpoints, maybe you're not necessarily on that endpoint, but um, it's like what what is the particular type of malware? Again, lots of different things here. What we're starting to see is where these ransomware campaigns, again, they're not going specifically after companies. They're, it's, it's very lucrative to go after a smaller, medium-sized business because they're likely to pay. A local government agency, also likely to pay. Um, charities, um, we didn't put 
medical up there, but hospitals, they're, man, like that is, people are going after hospitals, like healthcare organizations with ransomware like crazy because they're going to pay. Like it's like if you can't get to your x-ray imaging or your CAT scans or whatever because they're all encrypted um, and you can't function, like again, we talked about the Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center that turned around and paid the $17,000 ransom because it was just $17,000. It was like two Advil at a hospital. So they're like, they're like, and hey, a pair of rubber oh, gloves. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They're <laughs> like, oh, he got, did you use a rubber glove? And check. <laughs> um, and so, you know, they go after these organizations because $17,000 is a drop in the bucket. But I mean, and I'll make a call back to like, I did a, the keynote at B-Side Salt Lake this year and I said like, you know, we're going to see like a million dollar ransom and we are, I'm telling you it's coming because they know what the value of the data they're encrypting is and so they're starting to target specific organizations. It's becoming like, okay, if we can get our ransomware in that organization, we can make the ransom a hundred grand and they're going to pay it. Um, so. The other interesting here is gamers. <laughs> yeah. uh, gamers obviously having, I'm, I'm about to buy a gaming rig, th multiple thousand dollar machine that you spend hundreds of dollars on those games, thousands of dollars in some cases in all your games and your collection. If that entire machine gets locked up and they have a ransom of $300, $250, $500, whatever it may be, they're pretty likely to pay that again. So, um, it, it's all about the target and who they're looking at. They're, they're not doing this just cold swath, I guess, and, and, and casting a wide net. They're hitting as many people that they think will pay the ransom as possible. Yeah, and I mean, this is, I mean, we know that there's a specific shift in targeting gamers because um, when we talk about things like Tesla Surf or Locky or whatever, it's not like there's just a version of Locky and then that is the one and it's the re There are multiple, like, dot releases of these types of ransomware. So one of these particular updates that came to TeslaCrypt was that it was targeting gamers specifically. You could see that it, uh, it encrypted all, you know, all the image files before and it had done office documents and different things like that. But in this case, it, it was a, a bit flipped somewhere and now it was going after your Steam configuration files, uh, the World of Warcraft folder. Like it was going after gamers specifically. Like it was like, oh, hey, let's throw those people in there. Because if you've put hundreds of hours into your game and you don't want to lose everything, or you've got, again, um, in some cases, <coughs> I could say thousands. I've spent, yeah, absolutely. I've spent yeah, yeah. Them. Uh, I, that's I, why I said thousands. I love video games. <laughs> I love them so much. I'm in, a, I'm in a bad place. Yeah, if there's a Steam sale, like, you can, like, hear the vacuum from my wallet. Like, it's just like, <laughs> like, I'm just like, get all the games. I don't have time to play any of them, but I have to have them, so. Um, so yeah, so we know that like they're doing market research essentially and they're saying who are the people who are paying? Oh, here's an area we could go after. It's like a bunch of uh, you know, leather jacket wearing, sunglass wearing guys got around a boardroom table and said, how do we expand our market base? Um, so, and they're like gamers, um, so there they are. But looking at stuff from like an endpoint and saying like, okay, maybe you're not sitting at the machine, what is the, like if you're looking at it and you're just saying, oh, I can see that this is going off, you know, maybe there are these processes taking place, stuff like that. Obviously the presentation of the extortion demand is, is more than likely going to give you what the variant is. Um, it doesn't always call out like, hey, I'm Tesla Crip, um, but in some cases it does. Um, in a lot of cases it does. It'll just say like, I'm Locky, if you want the Locky decryption, it's this. Uh, you, you have to go through these steps. But the protocols that it's using for data transmission and the methods of encryption are also specific types of uh, ransomware use different methods of encrypting those files. Um, so if you were looking at something and you had no knowledge, maybe you're doing uh, forensic analysis after the fact, you could say, okay, well, it's encrypted with this and this, and that lets us know that it's probably these variants. Um, <coughs> and then, of course, specific C2 servers. So where is it sending its command and control you know, information? Where is it saying like, oh, hey, I've just gotten done encrypting. So um, I, when that particular group in Europe was, I guess they were breached, you know, and they were looking at their financial documentations tracking, they knew exactly how many sh machines they had infected, how many hadn't paid up to that point, how much time was left on the countdown for their you know, uh, like it was, all that information was there. So that information gets delivered to the command and control server, and if we know where they're communicating to, and we can attribute that to a specific type of 
ransomware, then we can say that's how we combat it. So, um, and then domain generating algorithms, what are the algorithms they're using if the domain to go pay is 10 random characters, dot com or something like that. So. Um, does anybody know what this is from? Sci-fi, did I even yell at that? Course comp. 2001, all right, so 2001, and this? Planet there we of the go. Apes. All right. So, uh, so the reason these are in here is basically because sometimes maybe your strategy is to just shelve the infected machine. And the reason that we say that is because what both of these movies have in common is that, you know, deep space travel, uh, they put you in some kind of like cryostasis or whatever, and you sit there for a while, and then eventually when you get to your destination, they wake you up. That's kind of the thing about shelving one of these machines. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but the cure may not be available now, but what about tomorrow? And sometimes it is like you know, literally tomorrow. So uh, when you saw Tesla Crypt, and we had uh, Tesla Crypt earlier, it had the asterisks up at the top. Um, so the master decryption key was either published or leaked, I'd say published, um, in, in May of 2016. So we know that that's the time frame when that support portion of it, remember we talked about support in the message center, um, it was the guys at, uh, who was it, GSDT or something like that, they, had, they basically, they clicked on the support wow. thing and they sent them a message and just said, hi, can we please have the master decryption key? And they said, yes, we're sorry. Literally. And they sent them the decryption key. And they sent key. them the master decryption key and they were like, wait, what? Like, the, they're like, is this legit? And they thought, like, there's no way they just sent us the master decryption key. But then they used it. Yeah, and then they used it, and they infected some other machines, and they used it, and they're like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, all we had to do was ask. Like, and that's literally what it took. They just asked, like, can we please have the master decryption key? They even key? got a sorry And in they there. got a sorry. They got an apology out of it. You know? So um, are they genuinely sorry? Who knows? Or have they, and have they retired? Probably. They just went off to a beach just and, like you said, didn't want to get caught. <laughs> so. Sitting on a beach and cutting there in Cabo right now, just like, oh, it's good. You guys can have the key. We made, you know, 200K a day or something like that. So, you know, people were like, well, were they hacked by another gang to ruin their rivals' businesses? These were all, like, questions that were asked in the, you know, there's a link down there on that Sophos blog post. They were saying, like, are, were they hacked by another gang? Is that why they were, why would they do this? Why would they release the master key? Um, or did they switch their time and effort to another, a newer ransomware? Did Lockheed came out in February and by May they were like, oh, you know, like guys were like, this is the hotness, this is where we should focus our efforts. Um, and so they switched over um, again, or did they make so much money they just wanted to retire in a media friendly way? And they're just like, thanks, like we're real sorry about it. Like, I'm gonna go drive my Lamborghini here in my garage. <laughs> I, the best part about that is they got a sorry. That's, that's the funniest part. That. So with combating it, we'll go into, oh, throw a little sci-fi stuff up there as well. Um, does anybody know the name of that Borg right there? Come on. Who said Hugh? That was amazing. That was so fast. Um, <laughs> it is Hugh. What season and episode? See, this no, see, this guy told me last night. We were going through the slides, and he was like, "I think season five, episode, I don't know, uh, twenty-three, don't, it's episode twenty-three. Oh, you looked it up. Um, so, yeah, but I really, I was like, it's season five. It's about season five somewhere there. But yeah, season five, episode twenty-three. Um, so this is like they basically they discover. Well, I like I am a nerd. Like I like all nerdy things. Like I I, I like Star Trek. I like Star Wars. I like Harry Potter. I'm like I I love it all. Um, so yeah, so in this particular episode, they come across a Borg who's injured, they take him back to the ship and they give him medical attention, there's a back and forth, about, do we let him die, what do we do, da da da. And basically what they would like to do, what Captain Picard would like to do, is he's saying, well, we could introduce what is essentially an equation, an unsolvable riddle or something like that, that they can, you know, give to Hugh um, and send back to the Borg Collective and when he is returned to the collective and that, you know, uh, basically puzzle 
is, is input. They will all grind away on it until they die. I'm like, that's a hell of a puzzle. It sounds like Lost Mystery Challenge at DEF CON. Um, but yeah, you just grind away on it until you die. Because you don't eat, and you don't sleep, and you don't do whatever, and so it kills you. But obviously there's this whole back and forth on whether or not that's ethical to commit genocide and all whatever. But what it was is like, how do we make these guys just grind away on something so that they're no longer a threat? Um, and so the idea is like, can we sinkhole ransomware? So when ransomware goes into a system, it will it goes out, scans all the files, and a lot of cases what it will actually do is just copy the file, encrypt it, and then delete the original. Um, but it has to gain an idea of what it's about to encrypt, what it's going to do, and so can we confuse it? Um, and there is a method that we um, will talk about because I just think it's kind of neat uh, because it's a more active approach. But it needs a listing of your files in order to you know, encrypt everything. And so what if we use recursive mount points? to just keep the ransomware busy. And so when it's looking, it just keeps grinding away and it gets flipped back and back and back and back and back. And in that, you also introduce canary files. So if those files are, should never be accessed by anyone at any point. And if that file is accessed, it tells you immediately, someone has touched me. Like, bad touch. <laughs> uh, I got the bad touch. Show me on the server where Where the bad you. man touched you. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, so what it basically what you're trying to do is create something in there to give you a heads up and allow you to you know ha maybe have a little bit of time to realize something's going on and take some kind of action. Uh, I I don't know how effective this would actually be in practice. I just kind of dig that some somebody's trying to take an active approach to it. Um, there's also we were looking at there was a talk. And it was in the demo labs at DEF CON this year, so there isn't a recording of it, unfortunately. Though I think there's a guy called Weston Hecker. The dude is like a mad scientist. I highly recommend you go look at some of his talks. Um, but Weston did a demo labs talk about a tool that he's making to try to like basically detect or mess with uh, ransomware, some sandboxing stuff as well. And it's called Emo Tool. So um, go check that out. Uh, but I like that people are you know, really trying to figure things out. And it seems to be more just casual researchers and less um, companies that should be fixing this. So how do you detect it? How do you even know you have a problem? So one thing, I know you can flag a process that reads or writes the you know, files too many times. So it's like it's, it's doing it too quickly. And I've actually seen this and people put this into practice where they're like, okay, it is like you are trying to touch too many files like in a short amount of time that is not what we would consider human behavior, or you're not an approved process to be able to do that, and so it cuts it off at the knees. Like that is, is I think, a solid, you know, method of of uh, one discovery, and then also, again, trying to prevention. mitigate it and prevention if you can. Yeah. Um, this one too. So uh, files have particular entropy values. When you encrypt files, like you know, it's like you're doing it all at once, and you're putting in a nice, neat little thing. You end up making the files look more uniform, actually, which is ironic, but than they normally do. Um, and so, if you see that type of behavior happening, a process is making changes. There's a lot of values changing to your files on there. That could be a red flag. Um, and then, of course, in here, uh, again, canary files. So, I like this because it's not necessarily a honeypot, but it is something that will alert you that someone is touching something they shouldn't be, and that's just creating a bunch of decoy files and putting them in different locations that should never be accessed, and should somebody try to access that, um, you get a notification. So we talked about these. Go ahead if you want to. This one's, this one's interesting. So okay. uh, close the notification window with Task Manager, and you this talked is, about yeah, this. Yeah, we talked about like the old like the old locker stuff, like the really old stuff, you could just like kill the process and then you could get past some of it. <laughs> Control, um, like, delete, like task manager. manager. Or you could just use System Kernel's process explorer and actually do it. Because sometimes it would lock you out of the task manager, but you could still use like System Kernel's and go in and, and kill the process. And now you're not locked out of your machine anymore. So again, obviously the developers of ransomware and malware have gotten wise to things like that. But if you get hit by something old, Again, things like this, like setting back your BIOS clock if you have something that's giving you a countdown. Some of the malware actually just works against like it's a freaking poorly coded Android app. Um, 
<laughs> you know, you play those games and it's like, oh, you can't get some more like credits until for 24, 24 hours. hours. And you're just like, oh, I will change the date. And then, um, so that's basically what you're doing to the ransomware. And then here, um, Microsoft's uh, volume shadow copy service. So some ransomware will go in there and try to delete all the shadow copies. And basically, what if, you, if you're not familiar with what shadow copy service is, it's backup kind of. It's you know the older versions of the files that you had. And, and so what the ransomware will try to do is kill it. But what we have seen with a lot of ransomware is it will fail at doing that. It has a hard time actually deleting the shadow copies. So sometimes it looks like everything's locked down, but go in, look, and see if the shadow copies are still there, and you might be okay. Do not put your uh, trust in Microsoft at that point. That would be your only backup, obviously. And we've talked about this over and over and over at this point. Air gap backups, air gap yeah, backups. Seriously, air gap like, backups. I mean, it kills me because a lot of these small businesses and mom and pop places or whatever, it's like, look, I get it, ransomware. It's like, you know, oh, what are the odds it's going to hit me? You know what? Probably fairly good um, if you're the kind of person who clicks on all kinds of crap. So basically, like, you know, all of our parents. Um, <laughs> Like, like, that's like, come on, you know? I, it's like, how are you, what are you doing? Like, stop <laughs> clicking everything. Well, it popped up and said I had a virus. Well, now you do. When, they're, <laughs> like, it's, when their browser is only a quarter inch tall on the screen yeah. because the rest is toolbars that they've installed. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's Good horrible. Night. So it's not, you know, it's not going away. But the thing is, is like now with it locking down files and stuff like that, it's like the ransomware is normally between three hundred to five hundred dollars. In some cases, a thousand dollars. You know, in in general, uh, for your average lockdown or whatever. So uh, it's a lot cheaper just to go to Costco and pick up a you know four terabyte external drive and dump your stuff to it and just keep it in a closet and do that once a week or whatever. Um, <clears throat> like I don't. It's a hundred dollars versus a thousand dollars. Like make the investment. So, uh, so that's all we got as far as uh, slide stuff. So thanks. But do you guys have any questions? All right, bring it. Wait, is the mic on? Because everybody should hear it if you have it. Is that mic on? It is? Yeah, use that mic so everybody can hear. He's going to fix our ransomware problem. Yeah. Yes. Everybody give him a hand. <laughs> He's like, not fixed. Hey. You know. Slightly prevent. Cool. Are we there? Are we there? You okay? Yep. All right, so two highly effective things everybody in the room can do. One, one of the flaws they take advantage of is they're sending us scripting files. And Windows by default has these scripting files associated with detonation, execute them in WScript. So everybody in this room can go and change the execution of these by saying, hey, when it's a .js, .wsh, .wsf, don't open these in scripting, open these in notepad. Then these will not detonate. So even if they send you a zip file, you extract them. This is highly effective. We wiped out uh, probably 80% of our ransomware doing that one thing alone. GPO or mom and dad's system, in my parents' case. They'll be here later today, so I can pick on them later in my talk. Um, also, in the email gateway or exchange, if you have this ability, block these from coming in. Yeah. Now, this won't stop the executable that it come in, the .exes, which would be the next wave, because uh, Microsoft has announced uh, 2013 has that blocking capability of the macros. But those two things, if you can block these scripts coming in from your email gateway or exchange, not much you can do about it at your home, and change your file associations, you are going to cripple the ability of this ransomware to even detonate. So uh, that's my tip. For that Give the man a hand. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. I like that. <clears throat> oh, he's got And couldn't see my talk at 3 o'clock. Ah, ah, nice. I like it. Plug. Wait, what's, what's the talk called? Uh, logging for hackers. Logging for hackers. Three o'clock. What track? Sounds here. boring. Here. Right here. That's not, <laughs> oh, I'm just that's kidding. Horrible. That was horrible. That's I apologize. Horrible. No. <laughs> Go um, ahead. Nothing. Uh, the question is, what is law enforcement doing to get ahead of the problem? Nothing. They're sending out they're saying, notifications send, yeah. saying air gap. They're saying send a, do air gap backups, and they're legitimate. Like you can report things where you say like, oh, we have a problem here. I mean, honestly, like if you want my honest opinion on stuff like that, th like ransomware is a problem for um, for mom and pop shops. It's a problem for uh, home users, things like that. It does suck if it gets into an organization or whatever, but. Um, but business email fraud and stuff, where, I mean, we're talking about like sending an email to an executive and saying transfer a quarter of a million dollars to here, it's from the CFO or whatever, like that is 
far, far more um, expensive for, for large corporations and so on. And so law enforcement cares a lot more about that than they do about this. Um, with this, they're just like, don't pay the ransom. Yeah, but can I get my files back? Not necessarily. I'm going to pay it then. You know, like they're legitimately the, 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 the recommendation from law enforcement is just to not pay the ransom. Um, and, and unofficial capacities, or you can find quotes from people who say, yeah, you should just pay it. But, um, yeah. What are, what are effective ways that you have found to educate the user base on how to avoid and recognize ransomware? That's an awful question because you <laughs> used the word effective. Um, yeah. <clears throat> really, during my day job, we, we, we sell classes and training and stuff like that that we can give to customers to, to teach them and, and educate them on this type of thing and not click on those links and not do this and make strong passwords. It, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's effective though today. You still have users that are clicking on that. You know every time that we go through our annual training, I sit through that exact same training that we sell other customers because we eat our own dog food and I, I don't pay attention most of the time. Um, I, I feel like I'm a little more educated than some of those other users, but a lot of times they're just not paying attention and, and it doesn't matter to them. It's something that they have to do once a year uh, and it doesn't mean the same thing to not open up a file just because it looked like it was from somebody you work with, et cetera. So, so even if you, yeah, even if you're implementing those programs, and you should be, like, that's not you that absolutely you should, be. should be. I'm the saying you should like, not. So saying let's you say you go out and do like go out and do a phishing campaign, like you know, in your organization. Like just go do it. It's not expensive to do. You can find software that's really cheap that will help you do it and stuff like that. And then find out what your return is. Like, do you have 80% of your users who are clicking on stuff? I, you know, like, spoiler alert, you do. 80% of the people in your organization are going to freaking click on the email. Then go back, have a discussion with them about, you know, what happened and why they clicked on it and what that could do for the company and whatever, and then do it again a couple of weeks later, and you'll have 25% of the people still click on it. The problem is you have 25% of the people still clicking on it. So is it effective? To a point. Is it effective in keeping everything out? No. You have one so, percent clicking on it. That you, you can be infected at that point. Your organization can it can spread throughout the organization. But uh, there are different campaigns out there too, as Grifter mentioned about phishing. That that literally, if they click on it, it'll take them to a page and make them go through the training, training. right then and there. Yeah. So the there's 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 plenty of options. But honestly, that word effective, it's. Yeah, when we were talking about like how ransomware is getting into the environment, like I said, these are 20-year-old issues. Techniques like, that, yeah, that still we're work. We're talking about 90s level attacks that still work today, and they work because you know, like most users don't care about security. Um, and we're getting, I think we're gaining traction. I think things, like people always say, oh, it's not gotten better at all in all the years that we've been doing this. And I don't agree with that. I think it has gotten better, but, um, but it's still not 100%. So you still have to have all of those things in place, and again, like air gap backups and uh, and a program to deal with it. So, all right, we got a lot of people in here. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>